And for more, I am joined by Yaakov Katz. He is the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. So we are seeing both Netanyahu and Gantz declaring victory in this election, but there can, of course, be only one winner. And most suggest that Netanyahu is the one with the most likely path to victory, certainly when it comes to building a coalition. Do you agree with that? I think so. The Israeli system is a coalition system. So even if Benny Gantz were to come up with one or two seats more or even a few more than that, although it now seems that it might be a dead heat tie down the middle, 35-35 or 36-35, one, one more than Netanyahu, it doesn't make a difference. At the end, it's who can build a coalition, who can get a majority in Israel's parliament, the Knesset. And that seems that the only track to that government, to that coalition, is in Netanyahu's hands. Uh, he has the ultra-Orthodox parties, he has the smaller right-wing parties, and Benny Gantz does not have a coalition, and that's ultimately what will determine who will continue or who will be Israel's prime minister. Right, and of course, this election was viewed as a referendum on Benjamin Netanyahu, and if that is the case, it has, has to be said that he's done very well, hasn't he, despite corruption charges against him, a possible indictment. But he did get a big boost from his friend, US President uh, Donald Trump. Why do you think voters in the end decided to stick with Netanyahu, as it appears to be the case? I think you're 100% right, Rosemary. This was a total referendum on Netanyahu, and he uh, he came out with with an excellent grade. Uh, the Israelis flocked behind him. They decided to vote for him in large numbers. And as you mentioned, not only did he get help, by the way, that boost from Donald Trump two weeks before elections when Netanyahu visited Washington and came back to Israel with recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, but he also then went a week later to visit Vladimir Putin in Moscow and came back with the remains of a soldier, an Israeli soldier who had been missing in action for 37 years, and in between that got a visit from the president of Brazil. So you saw an outpouring of world leaders who were kind of flocking here and basically signaling to Israelis, we enjoy working with this guy. We want Netanyahu to stay in power. And I think that that's the story. The story for Israelis is that they look around and they see the foreign credentials that Netanyahu brings, the way he can open up the doors to capitals around the world, whether it's D.C., Moscow, uh, and other places everywhere across the globe. They see the economic success and the resilience of Israel. And, and therefore, they say, why touch it if it's not broken? On the other hand, there's no question that he's facing down a serious, uh, serious criminal allegations. There's already a recommendation that he be indicted on charges ranging from bribery to fraud to breach of trust. But despite all that, the Israeli people decided that they don't necessarily have faith in that legal process, and they prefer to have Netanyahu stay on as prime minister. And I think the bottom line is because Israelis look first and foremost at security. They want to know that they are safe and secure, and Netanyahu seems to be able to give them that feeling, right. and that's why they vote for him. And, uh, you know, given the power he has, it shouldn't be a surprise, and the boost he got from Donald Trump, but it has to be said, too, that Benny Gantz did very well for a newcomer and a, a novice uh, politician. What was it about Gantz that put him so close to victory? Because he did, he really gave Netanyahu a run for his money, didn't he? Oh, you're right, Rosemary, 100%. Look, Gantz came, and he didn't come alone. He came with two other former IDF generals, chiefs of staff just like him. So you had together the three of them with over 100 years of military experience, accumulatively. They were also joined by the party Eshatid, which was led by Yair Lapid, a former finance minister, and he kind of brought the infrastructure, the party infrastructure, and the activists on the ground. And they were able to put up a fight. And I think it was because for the first time there was a real formidable candidate or adversary to Netanyahu who had the security credentials that he has for so many years flaunted to the Israeli people. But that's what makes this story even more more amazing. And that's why a lot of Israelis today are calling him a magician, because even though Netanyahu, with the criminal charges, with the pending indictment, with the fact that he's been prime minister 13 years, 10 years consecutively, and he was up against three former IDF chiefs of staff, they still couldn't defeat him. And that's really the story of this election, is how Netanyahu has managed to hold on uh, by his teeth, almost, and, and able to stay, it seems. We'll see what happens in the coming days 
whether he gets the, tapped by the president to form that coalition, but it definitely looks like that's what's going to happen. And while that rivalry plays out, Palestinians are not happy uh, with the outcome either way. They view it as Israelis maintaining the status quo, abandoning the two-state solution. That's their view when they look at the numbers there and look at the seats. Where does it leave efforts to find peace in the region? And why do you think uh, there was that record low turnout for Israeli Arabs? for these elections. What might that signal? Well, that's a good question, and it's a story that is yet to be completely told, and we'll try to find out in the coming weeks exactly why there was that low turnout. But if I had to guess, and from what I'm hearing, look, the Israeli Arabs, who are about 2 million of Israel's 8.7 uh, million people, feel that there's nothing moving on their front. There's nothing moving on when it comes to the Palestinian issue. They feel that there's not enough investment in infrastructure and in their own communities. And they're also fed up, by the way, with their own representation in the Knesset, the Knesset members who come from the Arab community. And, and I think they, that what we're seeing is a, just a general sense of disappointment. But we'll see exactly how that plays out. When it comes to the peace process, we're still kind of waiting with a lot of anticipation to see what will happen with Donald Trump's, what he calls, deal of the century, the peace plan that he and his administration have been working on for the last two years. They're expected to roll it out sometime in the coming weeks now that elections in Israel are over, and especially in the fact that Netanyahu is remaining as prime minister, so it has that kind of stability and succession. But I wouldn't have a lot of great hope that anything is going to move here. We, we've seen that the Palestinians and the White House are not talking already for a couple of years, definitely since the administration moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. There's complete disconnect. To expect that Trump will be able to succeed somehow in getting the Palestinians back to the table, I'm not very hopeful. And the fact now that Netanyahu looks most likely to be forming a coalition that's going to be narrow, made up of ultra-Orthodox parties and of the right-wing parties, I would expect, actually, that we're going to see a prime minister who is vulnerable because of the criminal allegations and suspicions against him and who his partners will be able to extort out of him stuff that they haven't been able to do in the past. And therefore, to expect progress on the peace track, I wouldn't hold my breath. Very sobering analysis there. Yakov Katz, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it.